on June 5th, 1994, Lake Morena, California. Jonathan Scott, aged 23, and four other friends went camping in the woods. What started as a joyful trip turned into an absolute nightmare. During the 90s, my boys and I were pretty much the big troublemakers. We barely stayed home and often set out on various hikes. And the best part is that we loved being spontaneous and traveling to places that most people dodged. Back then, we didn't have Wi-Fi, mobile data, or anything that we have today. We simply relied on those gigantic foldable paper maps that we would take around. I think I still have more than dozens of those maps thrown in my garage. Those were some of the few things that I brought with me after I moved out from my family home. One of those unforgettable days was when we hiked to Lake Morena. The site was not too far from San Diego and the Mexican border. I still remember that day in the back of my head, as if it were yesterday. There were five of us, Daniel, Tyler, Matt, Arnold, and myself. Arnold and Matt were my childhood friends, while Daniel and Tyler were new lads introduced by Arnold who was their neighbor. If there's something you should know about me, it's that I do not enjoy interacting with new people. It's not that I'm an introvert or have difficulty making friends. I simply don't like to mix new people with the things that I love the most. So, when Arnold mentioned he was bringing his friends, I kept denying it. However, those boys came regardless. To make matters worse, they were only 17 years old. You can imagine the kind of chitter-chatter and clumsiness that ensued. For context, Arnold, Matt, and I were in our early 20s. The walk to the campsite began with the young boys complaining about how tired they were and wanting to rest every hour. I was growing increasingly frustrated since we had an entire day of walking ahead to reach the campsite on time. After two hours, the boys were already hungry, so we stopped midway to eat. Being in such an isolated area, there were no nearby food shops. We settled for chips and tuna sandwiches we had brought with us and started eating. Fifteen minutes later, I insisted that we continue walking, to avoid setting up tents in the dark. However, the boys insisted on resting for another fifteen minutes. Feeling annoyed, I marched ahead by myself, too pissed off to look back. Despite my anger, I heard footsteps behind me, suggesting they were following close behind. After about twenty minutes, I noticed a strange, coppery ozone smell. The kind of smell that you can taste in the back of your mouth when you've had a nosebleed. Still angry, I hesitated to turn and ask about the smell. Suddenly, a loud scream from what sounded like Matt alarmed me. I turned around only to find no one behind me. There was absolutely no sign of anyone as far as I could see. My heart sank with worry about the mysterious footsteps I had heard, distinct and close. When the scream came again, I knew something had gone terribly wrong. I rushed back down the path towards the source of the sound. To my relief, my friends were exactly where I had left them. Where did you go? Daniel twisted his ankle. What do we do now? Matt asked, clearly frightened. Not wanting to frighten them further with my earlier experience, I calmly took out the ankle spray from my bag and helped adjust Daniel's foot. I think we sat there for an hour straight, then began to walk slowly upwards. My frustration must have been evident on my face, which is why Daniel kept apologizing to me constantly. Despite my irritation, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for him limping along, burdened by a heavy bag and struggling to keep up with my fast pace. Feeling guilty, I took his bag from him and carried it ahead. With the weight off his shoulders, Daniel seemed to walk a bit better. In spite of our slow walk like that of a tortoise, we finally arrived near the lake after another four hours. The sun was about to set, 
and thick grey clouds hovered through the sky. Though we missed the chance to fully enjoy the picturesque view of the lake, we were fortunate to find several suitable spots to set up our tents along the lake's edge. Arnold and Matt quickly set up a tent large enough for both of them to share, while Daniel and Tyler did the same. As for me, I preferred to pitch my tent alone. It's a personal preference I've always held, except for sharing with my wife. While four of them were closer, my tent was a little further away because of a damp puddle in the center. Once our tents were set up, Arnold suggested we gather some wood to light a fire. With our flashlights in hand, we dispersed to different spots while Daniel stayed back to watch over the tent and take care of his sprained ankle. As I was gathering twigs and dry branches, I felt the sensation of someone dragging their feet behind me. I stood still, uncertain who it could be. Then all of a sudden, an overwhelming reek hit me, so repulsive it made me want to vomit. To this day, I still haven't smelt anything as horrible as that. It was like the smell of a freshly slain animal, blood and rotten meat combined. I tried to walk away, and each time I would stop, the footsteps behind me would also cease. Eventually, when I had enough, I turned around to confront them. It was Daniel. He had a strange look on his face. I asked him what was wrong, but he remained silent, gazing at me intently. Irritated, I told him to leave me alone. Instead, he started walking towards me without a limp, contrary to his earlier condition. So you were faking your ankle pain all along, I exclaimed, more baffled than angry. He didn't respond, he kept looking. What's the matter with you? I called out rudely. Then he stretched his mouth into an unsettling smile that seemed to be as wide as his face. No shit, that guy looked insanely terrifying. He started walking towards me, and the foul smell intensified, instilling fear rather than anger. I gave him a disapproving look and walked back towards the campsite. Upon reaching our campsite, I found Daniel sitting calmly on a log, relaxing his strained ankle on a small rock. There was no way he could have reached there before me, had he been there in the woods with me. I was thoroughly confused. After all, we had walked non-stop for four hours and I was quite hungry too. I reassured myself that it must have been my imagination and didn't bother to bring that thing up. Anyway, we all drank some beer, sang songs and roasted marshmallows and hot dogs. We were all enjoying ourselves immensely, but deep down I really wanted to ask Daniel what on earth was he doing in the woods and how he could have been walking without any problems. Without letting others notice, I walked up to him and asked what he was doing in the woods. He looked confused. I haven't gone into the woods. What are you on about? He asked. I stood silent for a few seconds and fake laughed to conceal my nervousness, passing my question off as a joke to not make myself look like a fool. But inside, I was unsettled. If it wasn't Daniel I'd seen, then who was it? I decided to keep my apprehension to myself. I didn't want to risk sounding crazy by sharing my experience with the group. As midnight approached, we walked to our respective tents. Knowing we had a long walk back home the next day, especially with Daniel's injured ankle, we agreed it was wise to wake up early and start our journey promptly. I headed to my tent and got in my sleeping bag. As the minutes ticked by, a profound silence surrounded the campsite. Yet despite the stillness and silence, I couldn't fall asleep. I lay there, in complete darkness, my mind racing, unable to shake off an unsettling feeling. Suddenly I heard a twig snap. I became alert, trying to comprehend who it was, but couldn't quite figure it out so I brushed it off thinking that it had to be an animal. 
but then that grotesque smell emerged again. Even though I was scared, I got a surge of courage and decided to get out of the tent. It was completely dark outside, so I turned my flashlight. I couldn't see anyone. Feeling a little on edge, I called out, Hello? Is anybody there? No answer. With no possible answer to what was happening, I simply told myself that I must have drunk a bit too much beer. So, I headed back inside the tent. The feeling of discomfort didn't leave me, and I could stop overthinking. Along with that, I felt a heavy sensation in the pit of my stomach, telling me that something was really wrong. I tried to force myself to sleep, then abruptly I heard Daniel's voice outside my tent. Hello? There. Is anybody? Hello? Someone said in a robotic, monotonous tone. Something inside me told me that it was not Daniel, that it was something else. My heart felt heavy, and my entire body became cold. That sound just kept getting louder, and I started to freak out. I was trying to stay calm, crossing my fingers and hoping it would all stop. Sadly, it didn't. My world came crashing down on me when my tent began to shake violently. I was so damn terrified. I made a hole in the tent with a Swiss knife that I had carried and ran over towards the nearest tent. I coincidentally ran over towards the tent where Daniel and Tyler were sleeping. They were shocked to find me sweating profusely in fear. There is someone here, I uttered. I never expected such matureness from young boys like them. Instead of doubting me, they decided to light a fire around the tent to keep all of us safe. We quickly woke Arnold and Matt as well and told them everything. We didn't sleep that entire night. As we were talking about it, we could smell that grotesque smell again. It almost made us throw up. Whatever it was, all five of us were determined to burn that thing to hell if it dared to mess with us again. It was indeed an insane night. But the fire seemed to keep the thing away, and when the sun came back up, we made it back home unscathed, save for Daniel's ankle. This was about 18 years ago. I just read the Anansi's Goatman story and it seemed to be eerily similar to what we experienced that night. Without a shadow of a doubt, there is something in the woods that's probably best not to mess with.